Just to give you a little background where we're coming from, especially if you're new with us today or the last week, um, the Man of Steel series is a five-week series. We're looking at the word steel. It's an acronym. The, the S in steel stood for son. Ultimately, if you're going to be a man of God, you've got to understand how to be a son, how to let somebody else be better than you, bigger than you, stronger than you, smarter than you, how to grow and learn from somebody else teaching you, how to be a son. And then the T uh, is for teacher, how to, how to be willing to invest your life in other people, how to, how to live and make choices so that they better those around you, how to care about whether or not you're wearing off on those around you in a good way, right? That's, we've all been around people who were good at that. Last week, we dealt with the first E. That was, that was uh, people who live an epic journey. Ultimately, God's saying, lock arms with other people and do something that matters with your life, you know? Lock arms with other people and find a vision, a direction, a passion, and, and do something valuable. And then today, we start, the last two weeks kind of go together. Today is, is the edge. It's that line. It's that place where we stand and we go, you know what? I will fight for this. I, I, will, I will stand, as Darren said in his video, these are my kids, my responsibility. They are my thing. I, I, I don't know if you got this from his face, but I think you mess with that wife and four kids and you probably got a good acre on your hands, right? I'm just thinking, you know, like that's, he's got a line I'm, I'm, this is an edge. You know, I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to relent on this. I, I will stand. But then next week, we deal with the, the L, which is love, which is ultimately how a man of God knows how to forgive. And ultimately, today we'll talk about how a man of God knows how to fight. Next week, we'll talk about how a man of God knows how not to fight, okay? And, and how to deal with in making the right choices of when you fight and when you don't. Because uh, you can really, really mess up your life fighting when you shouldn't fight and not fighting when you should, right? So let's just jump right in. The scripture we're going to read today is taken out of the Gospel of John, chapter 2. It'll be on the screen for you as we read. Uh, I'm going to be reading verse 13 and following all the way down into the early 20s. This is a story that you, many of you have heard, and, and if you were raised in, in or around the church, you've not only heard this story, but you've played it out when you were younger, like you saw, you know, they like would take pictures of Jesus in this and put it on the felt board, you know, or the overhead projector, if you go back that, you know, like you've seen visuals, you've done coloring books with this, uh, this story. Uh, this is a story of Jesus clearing the temple courts. And in, in the gospel of John, I read from John because in John, he uses a bull whip, which I think makes it even cooler, right? So I'm going to tell you the story. Uh, Jesus is walking along with his disciples and it's, it's the weekend of Passover. This is the biggest religious spiritual holiday of the year. All these, Christ, are these, these Jewish folks from all around the countryside, I mean miles and miles, even hundreds of miles away, are coming together, gathering in, in the city around the temple. Jesus looks into this special day when everybody's excited, they're passionate, they're happy. It's their Easter, okay? In fact, it's the reason why Easter is when it is for us, okay? It's, it's their Easter in that moment, Jesus has a come apart. Like I would call it a come to Jesus meeting, but Jesus was there, right? So it's, a, it's just a come to him meeting right there. And he fashions a bull whip and he runs everybody out of the house of worship, okay? Can you imagine how that would get around in Livingston County if Brother Fred did that right here? Uh, it's Easter Sunday morning and something is awry and wrong and he just goes, I have had my fill all of you go home, you know, and just, just run everybody out, okay? That's what happens. And so all of the religious folk and the, the leaders, even those that were supportive of Jesus, they're just going, I do not know what gives with this man. What is he thinking? What does he do? I love him, but oh my goodness, right? Here's the story. Let me read it to you. John 2, verse 13 says this. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifice. He also saw dealers at tables. Makes it sound a little like a casino. It wasn't a casino, okay? He saw dealers at tables uh, exchanging foreign money. We'll talk about that. And then just the next verse, I mean, it, like just the next verse, Jesus made a whip. So this means he did not freak out and react. He didn't like see a whip and grab it and start popping it in the air. He sat down and made a whip, okay? So he, this is, he had time to cool off and chose not to, right? 
He, he, he made the whip. And he chased them all out of the temple. Wow. You see all these pictures of Jesus, like on coffee mugs and pictures in people's houses. And back in the 70s, they were on velvet. You know what I mean? You got all these different pictures of Jesus. But, but never one do you like see anybody with some money changer laying on the ground like this and Jesus above him with a bull whip, right? Like you don't, nobody drew that picture for some reason. But that one's here. Let me keep going. It says he drove out the sheep. He drove out the cattle. He scattered the money changers' coins over the floor. And he turned over their tables. Next verse, in verse 16, it says, Then, going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. Would you guys say that phrase out loud? One, two, three. Passion for God's house will consume me. The word there is, we usually hear passion and house, but the real word that causes them to remember it is consume. Okay? Jesus is consumed. He's not acting like himself. He's doing something abnormal, unexpected. Okay? He is under the influence of passion, which has consumed him for the house of God. Verse 18, but the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, then show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaimed or yelled at him. It has taken 46 years to build the temple. And you, can re and you think you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. This is interesting about the development in time this is written early enough that they've not yet considered what Jesus says as Scripture. Okay, not yet. They're getting there. But they said they believed both the Scriptures and what Jesus said. Okay? This is early, early, when they're just beginning to trust him. So, by show of hands, does this passage perplex anyone? Anybody? Really? I know we read it. Like, nobody, I'm the only weird dude in the room who goes, I don't... I need to understand that better. I really need to. Everybody else is going, I don't want Jesus to bullwhip me. So I'm not going to raise my hand. Okay, let, let's look at this. I grew up in a setting, in a, in a church, where like, like you know, the, the, a lot of the folks would have like run the Girl Scouts out, you know, if somebody had tried to sell a box of cookies because of this passage. Like they were so sensitive to um, money not changing hands in a business kind of way in a church setting driven by this passage. It, ultimately, what they thought is that purchasing and selling or spending, that that was the real issue in the passage. And Jesus was so offended by someone selling a dove that he fashioned a bullwhip and popped it around. But let me toss out to you the possibility that there's a little more to the story than just that. It's a little more to the story than just that, no doubt. Here are a few things that we know about what was going on that day, and not only that, but what had gone on for years in the temple courts, and what for this moment Jesus sees with his own eyes, and what he knew to be true, he sees with his own eyes, and he is overwhelmed with passion. Remember, today's message is dealing with the things that a man is willing to stand on an edge and say, I will not stand for that. I, I will fight that. I will deal with that. I'm going to change that if at all possible. Here are four things that you need to know about the sin of the courtyard in the temple. The first one is unexpected, but let me explain it to you. The first problem that they had was that Jesus was dealing with what uh, he and many others would have called the laziness of worship. So let me tell you, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, it explains what was supposed to be going on there. It explains the fact that, that if you are a 19-year-old male in the Jewish world, you would have been married, you would have already had kids, and you were responsible to bring sacrifice on behalf of your family 
to the temple and on the day of Passover, give it. Here's what that's supposed to look like. A year before Passover, you're supposed to raise or buy a baby lamb. You are supposed to raise that lamb, feed that lamb, care for that lamb. In our world, we would name that lamb, give it a little, give it a little bracelet around its neck with rhinestones on it. You would put on Facebook your new lamb that you've gotten. This lamb would eat the scraps from your table. You would brush this lamb. You would give this lamb milk from your hands. You would love this lamb. He would become part of your family. If you had children, your children would play with the lamb and chase the lamb. And ultimately, you would know the lamb. The lamb would be to you like many of our dogs, cats, birds, lizards, snakes, whatever are for us in our home. The the lamb would have been uh, one step toward pet from barnyard animal. And then one day a year, you would pack up your lamb, your unblemished lamb. Do you know how they're unblemished? They're unblemished because for a year, you've made sure nothing happened to them. For a year, you have taken care of them. For a year, you have brushed the bugs out of their hair and you have dealt with. This is not just were they born unblemished. This is you showing your dedication to the sacrifice that you will keep it unblemished by the care you will put into the animal. And then you take that animal, 19-year-old male and older, you're married, you've got kids most likely, and you take your lamb and you give it to be slaughtered as a covering for the sins of your family. And so over time, what had happened was that people started talking and they went, you know what, man? I live 40 miles from Jerusalem. Do you know how hard it is to take my kids and my lamb and and my wife and put them on our two donkeys and ride 40 miles all the way there? The lamb wants to walk and the lamb pees on itself and the lamb gets donkey sick, you know? funny. You know, the lamb doesn't handle riding on the donkey very well. The the lamb, it's just difficult. It would be so much nicer if somebody else would just raise lambs right there by the temple so that when I go to the temple, I could just buy a lamb, have a lamb, sacrifice a lamb. But do you see how that completely changes what's going on? It takes the emotion out of it. You're not sacrificing something you love. You're sacrificing something you just bought. You're not sacrificing something that you've named. You're sacrificing something that you just paid for. You're not sacrificing something that is unblemished because you made sure it was cared for. You're sacrificing something that somebody else raised on a farm. And it completely undermines the value of the Jewish understanding of sacrifice. You see, the reason why Jewish people should have understood that God would donate to humanity something very close to him, something that he loved, something that he cared for in the form of his son, Jesus, is that they should have been sacrificing something very close to them once a year and giving something that hurt. The day of Passover was meant to be a day of sacrificing something that made your kids cry because you gave it up. You understand what I'm saying? And convenience won out in their world. And so Jesus' first frustration is the fact that laziness and convenience has led to a process among Christian, I'm sorry, Jewish families so that the value of sacrifice is gone. Now this is true in our world sometimes, isn't it? God might call me to missions, but man, it's easier to just send somebody else, you know? God might call me to lead my children to Christ, but man, it is so much easier to just call the preacher, you know? God might call me to invest in children, but that other person has taught children for so long, I'm just gonna let them do it. Ultimately, it comes down to this. Sacrifice is supposed to hurt. That's why they call it sacrifice. It's supposed to be inconvenient. It's not supposed to be wrapped around our every need. It's supposed to be dedicated to God's every desire. And so the people of God fell short in their sacrificial system and Jesus ran them out of the temple courts because for them worship had become an act of convenience and ease, not an act of sacrifice and personal giving. That's the first thing. And a very, very important thing for us to know as Christian people. Sacrifices were supposed to be inconvenient. They were supposed to cost you more than money. They were supposed to grab your heart. The second thing is this. Uh, businesses, business practices began to meet the need of that worshipers 
we're supposed to fulfill. That's really what I've been talking about here. And, and there's nothing wrong with business. Business is a great thing. There's nothing wrong with making a profit. That's also a great thing, not in any way whatsoever there. But when business and profit takes the place of sacrifice and giving, then all of a sudden you have an issue. And those of you who work in business, you know how this works, right? When all of a sudden profit becomes the goal, then things like inflation and price hikes and, and all of that starts to happen. And now, even though this lamb that a family should be able to maybe buy for, I'll use our words, maybe five bucks and then raise for a year, might have a total of 50 bucks in the lamb at the end of the year, uh, but you go to a temple to buy one and it's 500 bucks. Last week, Stephanie and I were driving down, uh, formerly known as West Kentucky Parkway, and, and, and we stopped at Uncle Lee's. Anybody like Uncle Lee's? I love Uncle Lee's. It's a mess in there, but man, you could find anything a hunter ever wanted. And, and I, I shoot a 22 rifle quite often, and if you know anything about ammunition, you know it's awfully difficult to find 22 ammunition anywhere right now. And every time I go anywhere near Uncle Lee's, I want to go buy a box while I'm there if I can. And so I go in and I walk up and, and I said, I'm going to ask the question everybody else is asking, do you have any 22 ammunition? And, and the woman said, I do, but you're not going to like it. And I said, if it's 22 ammunition, ma'am, I'm going to like it. And she, and she pulled it out. And now a normal brick of 22, I mean, 500 shells at Walmart, if you were able to get, it's about 30 bucks. It's about 30 bucks. She pulled it out and she goes, it's, uh, it's 68 bucks. I said, no, ma'am, I don't like it. What's going on? And she said, well, you need to understand something. We're not price gouging. These are better shells. Now, at first I did that. I was like, uh-huh. Yeah, better than Winchester and Federal and all the, yeah, I get it. No, I looked, I looked, and she was telling me the truth. These were Target shells. They were made out of a different kind of metal, a little more heat behind them. And, and honestly, the, this was a fine, fair price for this box of shells. And so I said, ma'am, I appreciate your honesty. I, I got, I mean, I got on my phone. I was Googling the brand. I wanted to know what they're supposed to cost. And, and she said, you know, it's okay. And I said, I'm going to go ahead. I'll buy one case because I don't have any more. I got to have some. So I bought one box of it and I took it out. But she was so concerned that I would think that she was price gouging because in our world that just happens, doesn't it? You know, has anyone bought gas lately? You know, right? Just imagine if that is what happened to worship. Just imagine this, okay? You show up at church. You haven't been at church in a year. You're like, I want to go to church. It's awesome. And, and, the, and, and, and the, they start to pass these plates in church and and, and just for your attendance, okay, you're thinking, you know what, it was a good church service. Mama always told me put something in the plate. I'm going to toss a 10 bow. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. That's great. But then when the plate gets to you, the usher goes, excuse me, sir, it's a $50 minimum today. Yeah, Brother Fred's like, amen to that. I like that too, you know. Well, let's shoot the moon. $100 minimum. Why not? Okay. And then what if, what if the usher said, and sir, I noticed you got three kids over there in kids ministry. That's, that's $75 a kid. And one of your kids can't behave. That's 150 for him. Okay. And, and this is just to show, I mean, it's just to show, right? Like you're not, you know, this is just what's happening. So now you're a 19 or older year old man. You've got a wife and kids. Your Jewish customs demand that you go to Passover. If you don't, you think you're going to hell. Like you're, 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 you're messed up. You're, you're no longer Jewish. You miss this and it is over. Your children are now under the, you know, the dominion of an angry God if you do this wrong, okay? And so when you get there, you've saved your money. You know a lamb is worth about 50 bucks. That's what they're worth. And you get there and they want 500 bucks. What ends up happening is that there's inflation, price hikes, and it becomes unfair to the poor, all of a sudden, those who don't have much, they just simply cannot afford to be forgiven of their sins. And Jesus says, that's an edge. I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to stand for that. You realize the, like the one time Jesus ever bragged on somebody's giving in the Bible, it was a woman who gave almost nothing financially, and yet it was everything. This woman, if she had been there that day, would not have been able to receive forgiveness of her sins in her mind because of the prices of the animals. The third thing that you need to be aware of, is this is so intriguing to me, is that there was a standard corrupt appraisal process. So here's what happens. Uh, let's say me and my family, we live 50 miles away and we want to do it right. So a year before, 
We get a lamb and it's born to, out of our herd and we raise it and we care for it and we brush it and my kids name it and they put the little sparkly necklace on it and we take care of it because that's our priceless, unblemished lamb and we want it cared for and we put it on the back of the donkey and we feed it the best of foods and it's, we don't let it get dirty so that it's white and beautiful and my kids hug it and the whole way there, my kids know this lamb is gonna be slaughtered and so they're saying goodbye to it, you know, and taking pictures with their smartphone smartphone and putting them on Snapfish, you know, so that they'll remember the picture forever. And, and they just love this lamb. And when you get there, they take the lamb up to the appraiser whose job it is to say whether or not this lamb is acceptable. And the appraisers say, actually, have you noticed how this one hoof is a little bigger than this other hoof? Or have you noticed how this one left leg is a little longer than the other leg? I tell you what, sir, what's going to need to happen is we're going to give you 30% credit for this one, but you're going to need to trade it in, and we're going to have to sell you this higher model, this, this better quality model, and it's going to cost you $460 for you to be able to have your sins forgiven today. You see how this works? Ridiculous. People were using these practices to stand in the way of the forgiveness, even of the families who were trying to do it the biblical way. And this angers Jesus. It brings about passion for his father's house. The last thing you need to be aware of is what are normally is referred to as money changers. Anybody ever traveled to a foreign land or to a place where they use different currency? So you've gone through the process. You've gone to maybe Canadian money or you've you know, been in Europe and you've changed it over to there. So ultimately, you know how this works. You walk in with you know, Ben Franklin's and that kind of thing and, and you trade it for the equivalent, Right? But then, but then sometimes it doesn't really feel like the equivalency is fair, right? In, in their world, here's what would happen. In their world, currency was regional. So every little region of people had different kinds of money that was coined. Most of it was metal, it was like coins, okay? It wasn't paper, uh, it was coins. And on the coins, do you know whose picture they would put on the coins of this one and this one and this one? If this is a Roman province, it's got the picture of Caesar, and they considered Caesar to be a, a god. And so when you would bring your coinage, and you lived in this Roman province, you bring your coinage with the pictures of Caesar on it, you would bring that. You're not allowed in this culture, in this time, you're not, and, and I even understand why, you're not allowed to buy a lamb that you're going to sacrifice to the real god with money that has pictures of false gods on it. Make sense? And so they would make you exchange the money for temple money. Anybody ever played Monopoly? Can you imagine, would you play Monopoly if you had to buy your Monopoly money with real money? I'm not, in, I'm not suggesting this. I'm just saying, would you, if you, you know, you sit down with a Monopoly player, you know, like somebody knows what they're doing, and they'll say, you can get in the game, but you've got to cash in, real deal. Give me 200 bucks, I'll give you 200 bucks, right? Because that's really what's happening. This temple money's good nowhere else. It's only good there. And then you've got to deal with the fact, what are the priests doing with a bunch of pictures of Caesar? Anyway, you know, they've got all these coins that they can't use that are supposed to be worthless. And so all of this stuff together, can you see the kind of corruption that was going on? And, and, and more than anything, please understand this. This is not an issue about financial corruption. That's not what Jesus is mad about. What Jesus gets passionate about is that all of these things stand in the way of the forgiveness of sins. All of these things stand in the way of people finding the connection with God that forgives their sins. All of these things stand in the way with what the sacrificial system was supposed to do, and that's point to the future of a perfect sacrifice that would allow all sins to be forgiven for anyone who would follow him. And so he is, what's the phrase that they remember from the Old Testament? He is consumed with passion for his father's house. In other words, I want people to get to my father's house and I'm consumed with passion for anything that would stand in their way. As Christians, you guys, we ought to be consumed with that same passion. The things that stand in the way of people knowing God. So let me make this very real. You ever been in a conversation with somebody who would not consider being a Christian or coming to church with you or anything like that and they had their reasons? Like they had their reasons, you know? 
if you've ever really taken the time to listen to their reasons, some of their reasons are nuts. They're just making them up, you know? But a lot of their reasons are solid. Time and time again, I've talked to people who said things like the sign that you saw, Chad. I grew up in church, and that's why I will never go back. And, and I don't know what they experienced. I don't know what they faced. But I bet that if Jesus were around with a bullwhip, some of those things would have been changed. Because of the fact that we as people have to really watch that we don't allow normalities and regularities in the religious culture to become the kinds of things that prevent people from meeting Christ, that discourage people from meeting Christ, that stand in the way of people meeting Christ. Can I throw you a few examples? About 10 years ago, a young teenager comes into the church I'm pastoring. He was raised by not much. He didn't have manners. He had attitude, okay? I mean, he, he had all kinds of struggles. But this morning, he decided to come to church. He rode a bicycle to church. And when he walked in the door, he had his ball cap on. And I saw a man in our church walk up to him and say, son, if you're going to come in here, you've got to take that hat off. And if you don't, I'm going to ask you to leave. And I asked that man to leave. Now, I get it. I was raised by a daddy who taught me not to wear my hat in church. I get it. Okay? You haven't seen me preaching in one. I get it. But do you know what was more important that day? What was more important that day had nothing to do with a ball cap. Nothing. And I think Jesus would have pulled out his whip. That day was a day when that young man had an opportunity to maybe have a good experience and follow Christ. And, and I, this, this, this man that talked to him, he's not a bad guy. He's a good guy. I know the guy really well. He's not a bad guy. But a normality and a regularity in church life for him became something that he let push someone away. And luckily, it didn't, it didn't work. That young man rode his bike to church the next week, and he didn't wear a hat. <laughs> he rode his bike next week. A few weeks later, I baptized that young man. Last week, that young man sent me a picture of his child who was just born to the girl that he married and wants to raise up in church. See what I'm saying? That young man was given up by his mom and dad before he knew who they were. He was raised by his grandmother who was an addict. He was brought up in a household where whenever their infant baby in that family died, the only person who knew well enough to even call the cops was the, the nine-year-old boy. It's a wonder this kid's not a serial killer. And he's following Jesus, married a woman, raising a baby. Right? And that's the kind of thing that God can do. When the church is a place that is open and welcoming with the gospel, encouraging people who are far from God to be a part of following him, encouraging the forgiveness of sins, encouraging the things that Jesus cares about most. See, so I ask us all to ask these questions. This is the kind of thing, just two things and I'm done, uh, is that consumers, which is what they were having that day, that's what people were doing, they were buying all the stuff. Consumers are typically concerned about their needs being met. I need a lamb, I need a dove, I need that stuff. I need to not have to carry it all the way here from home, okay? I need that stuff. But worshipers, worshipers are concerned about meeting the needs of the world on behalf of God. Maybe another way to say it, using males as I am one, is that men, boys are concerned about their interests. This is the next slide. Boys are concerned about their interests. There's nothing wrong with that, right? My boys are concerned about their interests. Your boys concerned about their interests? My boys are all about their iPads and their bicycles and their bass fishing, you know? They're very concerned about their interests. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. We went mountain biking this week like that, you know, that's great. I, when I was a kid, it was the original Nintendo, you know, with, with Tetris and Donkey Kong, you know, and, 
and, and, and Super Mario Brothers. That was, I was all about that. If I went to somebody else's house, I wanted to roll it all up and pack it up and take it with me. I thought about it while I was at school. I thought about it when I got home and when my parents said, that's enough, quit playing it, I was still thinking about it. I get that. I grew up with that, my interest. I thought about Kentucky basketball and Cardinals baseball. I thought about all of those things, those interests consumed me. Boys are passionate about their interests, but men are passionate about God's mission. Men are passionate about God's mission. Now that does not mean, men, that we will not continue to have interests, that we will share our passions with. I was out till one in the morning chasing a blue tick hound who qualified for the world show yesterday, by the way. Proud of him. But when the day, when the day comes that my passion for the interests of God are comparable to my passion for a blue tick hound, I'm acting like a boy, not a man. Right? Boys are passionate about their interests. Men of steel, men of God. And ladies, you don't get out of this. Adult believers in Christ should be passionate, consumed by the edge that we stand on that drives Jesus' passions and desires for the people of this world. That ultimately means that we know what's important. We know what's of ultimate value. And our lives are committed to and dedicated to it. Would you pray with me?